So I'd like to welcome you all um, to today's webinar. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Casey Evans and I'm the current president for Alpha Phi Sigma for the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, 2017, we started an event series that included panel discussions, speaker events, and other forms of dialogue on issues related to criminology, criminal justice, and the law. I'd like, it to, I'd like to take a minute today to thank the students, faculty, and staff um, in the School of Public Affairs for their support and extend a special thank you to the Dean of the School of Public Affairs, Paul Teske, for his help, to our events coordinator, Emma Martz, and to our marketing director, Tula Wellbrook, for facilitating these events. Um, finally, I would like to acknowledge our Student Criminal Justice Honor Society, Alpha Phi Sigma, for their role in putting together these events. This evening's guest speaker will talk about international human rights violations and prosecuting war crimes. Ken Scott, as you can see on the screen, has spent his career fighting large-scale injustices from white-collar crime to human rights violations and war crimes. In his last trial at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, he convicted a prime minister, defense minister, two army chiefs of staff, the head of the military police, and another senior government official for war crimes involving ethnic cleansing. After serving for 12 years as a federal prosecutor in Denver, focusing largely on white collar and environmental crimes, Ken and his family moved to The Hague where he was a senior prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia for 14 years. Since returning to Denver, he's been engaged in wide ranging human rights and war crimes practice, was appointed a UN commissioner on human rights in South Sudan, and continues to act as a special prosecutor at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, also in The Hague. He consults on various projects and engages in training throughout Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to him for his presentation. Um, just a few things for the audience to keep in mind. The last 20 to 30 minutes of this evening's event will be reserved for audience questions. So feel free to keep those under wraps until that last little time period and we'll get to them. Um, please submit any questions through the Q&A feature. You can do this anonymously. Um, and if you would like, or if you like someone's question, you can also give it a thumbs up. That way we know um, that more people want that answered. And then if you have any comments throughout the presentation, please feel free to just message through the chat feature um, in the Zoom call. For anyone here with APS attending for one of their events for the semester, please try to message me your name and email through the chat feature so that I can account for your attendance as well. Finally, this event will be recorded and the video will be added to the School of Public Affairs website on the events archive page, usually a week following the event, just so everybody knows. Thank you again for coming. I'm super excited to get this started. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ken. Well, thank you very much, Casey. Really appreciate that. Um, and it's good to be here this evening. And uh, it's a shame that we can't all be together in um, the pre-COVA situation, but um, we'll all do the best we can. Uh, again, before we start, I just want to thank, uh, I want to thank Sheila Huss and Emma Martz for organizing this event and for all their hard work in doing so. And again, to thank Casey for her help this evening. Um, I have a rather long and detailed PowerPoint. So you're going to be seeing the PowerPoint a lot more than me, uh, which is probably just as well. Um, so um, we'll just move through that reasonably try to move through that reasonably quickly, although it'll take some time and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time at the end to uh, have questions and answers. So save up your questions or put them in the, I guess as they say in the Q and A. So um, really I, I just thought, I thought I'd start with giving you some idea of sort of my orientation to international criminal justice, um, something that I've come to believe over the past uh, 20 years now of, of doing this kind of work. Um, and, that is, and that is this, achieving durable peace rather than a temporary, even a 10 or 20 year ceasefire requires that root causes of conflicts and grievances be addressed and resolved and such resolution concerning long conflicts, often with atrocities and war crimes generally requires a bona fide justice process, including criminal accountability for those most responsible 
for such conduct with justice both done and seen to be done. So I'm hoping this, uh, I'm hoping this uh, talk this evening will be helpful to all of you. I know many of you are in the criminal justice program and I've tried to shape this around uh, the intersection, if you will, of human rights, international law, and international criminal justice. We're, we're really taking international, we're really taking criminal justice to the international level. And in that regard, there, there's been two movements really in the last 30 years that have especially contributed to a faster pace of development of international law. One of those has been the international human rights movement, which many of you are familiar with. And the other, the other major movement has been on the international criminal justice side, the development of international criminal justice and individual criminal responsibility. And by that, I mean essentially holding individuals responsible in an international arena, similar to the way we hold, we hold people, individuals responsible, criminally responsible in our domestic and national courts. And there's a lot of challenges to doing that in the international arena, but uh, we, we continue to learn as we go. Uh, and now that we've been doing it for about 25 years uh, since the Yugoslavia Tribunal was formed. So first I'm gonna take you through uh, just some of the background leading up to where we are today. And then I'm going to, uh, in terms of the international justice, international courts. And then I'm gonna focus on my last trial in The Hague. Um, well, actually not my last trial, I've had trials since then, but my last trial at the Yugoslavia Tribunal <clears throat> and give you a flavor of the trial, what that was all about and, and some of the insights into that. And then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions. So really we start with Nuremberg as I'm sure all of you have heard of. Nuremberg, the, the Nuremberg trials were initiated after World War II in, in Europe. Uh, it is really the first meaningful, real international criminal tribunal and marks the true starting point of international criminal law. I say the first meaningful or real because there were some, there were some relatively small scale uh, war crimes trials after World War I, but um, overall they didn't really amount to that much. Um, there have been other war crimes uh, situations and efforts to hold people accountable in the past, uh, even during ancient times actually, and certainly during uh, the various wars, the Civil War, there was a code, the Libra Code that was developed to uh, govern armed conflict and what was fair to do, what was legal to do and not. Uh, so in some sense, dealing with war and the law of war goes back a long ways. But in particular, really, it was Nuremberg that is the, is the modern starting point for international criminal justice. The Nuremberg Charter in this regard recognized and said, crimes against international law are committed by men, not by abstract entities. And only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provisions of international law be enforced. And that may seem like old hat to us now, but at the time it was it was still fairly fairly novel and fairly you know a breakthrough in saying that we were going to actually hold Nazis and others responsible for their conduct uh, during the war. Um, so it was a pretty big deal. The Nuremberg Charter even today is still considered part of international law, with the UN General Assembly affirming the charter in 1946. As with Nuremberg, there was, also, there was also the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, also called sometimes the Tokyo Tribunal, which was established in January 1946 to deal with Japanese war crimes, uh, essentially similar to Nuremberg, but in that, in that arena, in that theater of the war, the World War II. Again, one of the, one of the precedents for international criminal justice. Then there was a long hiatus after the after World War II in those tribunals, and the next the next time we had an international criminal tribunal of any sort was in fact the tribunal considered concerning the Yugoslavia conflict, or what some people call Bosnia, and all the war crimes that were committed there. That was created in 1993 by UN Security Council Resolution 827. It is again the first war crimes tribunal since World War II. 
and the first international tribunal established pursuant to UN Charter Chapter 7. That is simply a, to give you a look, uh, look at what the building, what the ICTY physically looked like. Uh, nothing particularly grandiose. It had actually been an insurance, it had actually been insurance company offices until it was uh, purchased and converted into uh, three courtrooms and a lot of office space uh, by the UN in The Hague. The ICTY mandate and uh, objectives to bring to justice the most senior persons responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law, also called the law of war, also called the law of armed conflict in the former Yugoslavia to assist in ending the violence and restoring peace in Southeast Europe and to deter violations of international humanitarian law at other times in other places. Uh, in reference to the first item, um, clearly what the, what the UN wanted us to do, what the Security Council, the Security Council wanted to happen with the tribunal and the mandate that was given was not to prosecute the foot soldiers or the low level actors, but to hold those as most the most senior persons responsible. Really, that was the that was the target. That was the that was the goal of holding them responsible. The people like Milosevic, the people like uh, Ratko Mladic, the people like uh, on the Croat side, uh, and and crimes committed on the Muslim side as well. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple some of these just in the interest of time. It was obviously a large, difficult undertaking, involving lots of cost. Uh, one of the questions that we get to. Uh, hopefully, have time. We'll talk about the concern about the cost of international justice. And I would just pause here and say, you know, think of, when you think about the cost, think about setting up an entire criminal justice system, from not only from a from a courthouse to courts to judges to uh, all the infrastructure to witness protection program to a legal aid system to all the interpretation and translation that has to go on since everything happening in Yugoslavia was in Serbo-Croatian. Everything had to be translated uh, primarily into English. Um, the extensive travel costs going back and forth between The Hague and Yugoslavia, et cetera, et cetera. So it is indeed, it was indeed a very expensive uh, proposition, but hopefully uh, well worth it in the end. Uh, I should say the tribunal finished its mandate in late 2017 and has transitioned it's essentially out of business. There is a, what's called a residual mechanism. There are two or three ongoing matters that were referred to sort of a scaled down version uh, just to finish up a few matters. But the tribunal itself has now been closed, now closed in 2017. The ICTY's accomplishments, holding senior responsible persons accountable, giving victims a voice, bringing justice to victims, establishing the facts, developing international law, strengthening the rule of law and restoring peace and supporting reconciliation. Some case statistics for you. Um, the ICTY indicted a total of 161 persons uh, 90 were, con were convicted on final on appeal, uh, 18 were acquitted. There are three still ongoing in ongoing proceedings, as I mentioned, at the residual mechanism. Uh, 13 cases where individuals were referred back to be prosecuted in national jurisdictions. Uh, I handled two of those cases. Uh, indictments were withdrawn in 20, as to 20 individuals for various reasons. Uh, 10 of the accused died before ever coming into the tribunal's custody, and seven died after coming into the ICTY's custody, uh, the most notable being Slobodan Milosevic, which some of you know, uh, passed away of a heart attack uh, during his trial. And unfortunately that trial never went to judgment. Sentences, people often ask me what kind of sentences people <laughs> Uh, the tribunals have. Um, the maximum sentence is life imprisonment. Uh, there is no death penalty. Uh, basically, um, some of the sentences, and I haven't not, I have not crunched the numbers in the last year or two, but this is pretty close to being right. 
Uh, about seven of accused were sentenced to life imprisonment, including Radovan Karadzic and Ratko Mladic and others, and five others. Uh, other longest sentences have been 40, 40, 35, 35, and 35 years. The shortest sentence was two years. And I don't recall offhand which case that was or why the sentence was so low, but uh, that's the shortest or lightest sentence that was ever issued uh, by, the, by the tribunal. There's nothing like probation. So it's basically serving a, and again, there's no death penalty. So it really comes down to serving a term of imprisonment. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, as it was the Rwanda genocide, that tribunal was created about a year after the Yugoslavia tribunal, essentially a similar model, a similar work, um, followed the same basic procedures and structures as the ICTY and um, also successfully prosecuted and convicted a large number of war criminals in connection with that conflict. There have been other international tribunals and special courts. Um, as I've already mentioned, the ICTY, which is now closed, the ICTR, Rwanda, which is now closed. There was a special court for Sierra Leone, uh, which is now closed. There is still the Cambodia uh, court. It is still going on, it still exists and is, but is increasingly inactive. Uh, I'm not sure how many more prosecutions, if any, are going to come out of that particular tribunal, but. It's still, it's, still, it's still operating to one degree or another. Uh, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, where I've also worked since 2014, um, is still ongoing. Uh, and then some others as well that I've mentioned there. So that, that all that is to give you an introduction to international criminal courts. Uh, going back to Nuremberg and Tokyo coming up to modern time. And then the next the big development was the establishment of, of the International Criminal Court. Some people call it the Permanent Court, which we'll talk about now. So <clears throat> the possible creation of a standing International Criminal Court with broad jurisdiction had been a matter of ongoing discussion from the end of World War II, again, to the mid 1990s. And when I say a standing court, not something created ad hoc, not something related to just one conflict, in the Yugoslavia tribunal only had jurisdiction to deal with matters concerning the Yugoslavia conflict. The same with Rwanda. It was only dealing with Rwanda genocide. They were special courts set up ad hoc to deal with a particular situation. Whereas the International Criminal Court is a permanent court, just like the Denver District Court, just like the federal courts. It exists, it goes on from day to day. It has not global jurisdiction because it depends a lot on the member states and where the situations develop, but it has a very broad jurisdiction, uh, which we'll come to a bit more in a moment. All that led finally in 1998 to the negotiation and ultimately the signing and adoption of what was called the Rome Treaty. And because some of the final negotiation diplomatic sessions were in Rome. And they signed that in 19, July 1998. Seven countries voted against the treaty, uh, China, Iraq, Israel, Libya, Qatar, Yemen, and the United States um, for various reasons. Uh, China said, like many, and it's an ongoing issue, an ongoing issue in international law generally, that when you have these kinds of courts and you talk about this sort of intervention, um, there's always the concern that uh, this is some transnational, international body sticking its nose into the affairs of a sovereign nation. And that's always a fundamental tension, if you will, in all of these, with all these courts. With the required ratification of 60 states, the Rome or ICC treaty went into effect on July 1, 2002, and the court officially opened, became operational in March, 2003. And as I said, it is the world's first permanent international criminal court. Um, so it's, and it sits in The Hague as well. Don't have a copy. I don't have a picture of that one, but I'll have to add one to our collection. 
one thing that's really important to realize to, to understand about the International Criminal Court is that it is, it is based on the concept of complementarity and is a court of last resort. What does all that mean? The ICC is, is, is to complement uh, national courts. If the national courts can do, are doing their own job, if they're doing their job and doing it reasonably well, if a country is cleaning up its own house, if there's been a conflict with a, in a country and efforts are under, underway in the national or domestic system and it's actually going on and it looks real, looks genuine, uh, then the ICC is not gonna get involved. Uh, it will only act or intervene if the state most directly involved is unwilling and or unable to genuinely deal with the matter itself. When you say unable, a lot of times in a post-conflict situation during the conflict, it may well be that the court system has become completely dysfunctional. Uh, the courts have been destroyed, uh, the judges have been scattered or killed, and there is no operating a justice system in a post-conflict country. So therefore, that's one situation again where the ICC might come in. Or it might come in where there is an existing justice system, but the go that government is not willing, uh, will not take care of itself, will not prosecute its own people, uh, will not deal with the justice issues that have come up. So if the state is unwilling to do it, then if there is otherwise jurisdiction, the ICC may intervene with its own investigations and prosecutions. <clears throat> as of October, as of now, 123 states out of a total 195 states in the world have ratified the Rome Treaty. Uh, Non-members, countries that are not uh, parties to the Rome Treaty at this point as of today, uh, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Israel, Syria, and a number of others you'll see there, and most notably, the Russian Federation, China, and the United States. So you can see that um, arguably the three, if there, are, if there are three superpowers in the world today, uh, none of them are members of the court and therefore uh, in general, not subject to the court's jurisdiction. There could be exceptions to that, which if we have time, we might have to be able to talk about. But generally they stand outside the International Criminal Court. And so people always ask me, well, what's, where's, where is the United States on this? What's the United States position? Um, the United States participated actively in the treaty negotiations, but as I said earlier, uh, voted against the treaty. Uh, the Clinton administration then came in and actually signed the, signed the treaty but did not send it to the Senate for ratification. So it's never been ratified. It's never really been processed to the point that we are actually a member. Uh, we, the United States are actually a member of the court. The Bush administration then turned, was hostile toward the court and actually formally withdrew the US signature that the Clinton administration had put on the treaty. Then the Obama administration reestablished a more positive working relationship with the court, was cooperative with the court, would assist the court in gathering evidence if it could, but uh, it did not, ratify, again, it took no steps to ratify the treaty. And frankly, it seems unlikely that it will be in the near future. And again, maybe we can talk about that more uh, during the questions and answers. As some might surmise, uh, the Trump administration has not, has not, and does not support the court. In fact, uh, a few months ago, on, in June 2020, President Trump signed an executive order authorizing sanctions and visa restrictions against any person, including ICC officials and their families, who in connect, connection with the ICC directly engages in any effort related to bringing U.S. persons before the court without U.S. consent. And the way that came up in particular was in connection with Afghanistan, because Afghanistan is a member of the court, is a party of the ICC. And therefore, for, for conduct that occurred in Afghanistan, the ICC technically has jurisdiction. So even though the United States is not a member of the court, and therefore generally outside the court's jurisdiction, because it was operating and acting on the ground in, US, in, in sorry, Afghanistan, um, which is a member of the court, there is potential ICC jurisdiction over US conduct 
in connection with the Afghan war. Uh, and that's what led to this strong statement of opposition and in fact sanctions uh, by the Trump administration in June. I'm going to skip over a few of these, just talking more about the International Criminal Court. Uh, just there's ongoing concerns and issues, um, some continuing resistance to the court, especially, especially in Africa. Uh, Burundi became the first member of the court to actually withdraw from the court in 2018, and the Philippines withdrew last year in 2019. Other countries have made some noise about uh, withdrawing, but have not yet, in fact, done so. Okay. All right. Well, let me get to the um, Perlich case to to the to the back to the ICTY. Um, so this is the last case that I tried at the ICTY in The Hague, and uh, we'll just got, get started on that. Take you through it. I'm going to give you a little bit more about the conflict. So we go back to April 1992. Um, some of you may be. Some of you may remember. A lot of you were probably not old enough at the time to know what was going on, or maybe uh, fairly, this is all back in 1992, the mid, early to mid nineties. But Boston, the Yugoslavia was breaking up. Uh, the states that made up Yugoslavia at the time included Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, uh, and other kind of, uh, a couple of other, Kosovo, uh, and I'm blanking on the last country that was the, um, Slovenia was also a member, but the, so the Yugoslavia was breaking up. And during that breakup, a number of the member of the members are declaring their own independence, including Bosnia. Bosnia was the most ethnically diverse of the, of the various republics, 43% uh, Muslim, 31% Serbian, 17% Croatian. But as it turned out, both, both Milosevic and the Serbs and Franjo Tuđman, the president of Croatia and the Croats, had designs on Bosnia territory to establish both a greater Serbia and a greater Croatia. And we'll see some of that in a few minutes, how that was done, what that looked like. Nationalism and ethnic tensions strained to the breaking point. Bosnia erupts into war. Thousands die. Uh, the best documented, I'm often asked, well, how many people actually died during the Bosnia conflict or during the wars in Yugoslavia? It's a very conservative number, but the best single documented number of direct, of direct deaths, uh, about 104,000. Many think it's much, much larger than that. But for purposes of going to court, and again, we have to remember we're here, we're talking about criminal justice and going into court according to court procedures, according to the rules of evidence. How do you prove how many people were killed during a conflict? And we had to, we had to come up with a number that we could defend in court. And the best documented number is about 104,000. More than a million people were certainly displaced by the, by the conflict. So that's all happening and unfolding in April, 1992. By 1995, by the time of the Dayton Peace Agreement, Bosnia had effectively been partitioned into three areas with each region governed by one of the three principal ethnic groups, either Serb, Croat, or Bosnian, Muslim or Bosnian. Ethnic cleansing was largely successful. By 1995, each ethnic enclave was roughly 90% homogeneous, whereas most parts of the country, or at least many, many parts of the country, had been very mixed and very diverse when the war started. So how did this happen? How did we get to that point? Well, the president of Franjo Tuđman and was a, was, a, was a strong nationalist and he really wanted to expand Croatia. And we'll see some of his statements now. I should add that uh, and some of you might be interested to know that some of the incredible evidence that we were able to develop uh, through our investigation and huge efforts, we, we found out that uh, perhaps much like President Nixon, Franjo Tuđman had a recording had a recording system in his office and in his conference room. And lo and behold, um, many of the meetings, the high level meetings during the Yugoslavia conflict in his office were recorded and were transcribed. And uh, fortunately for us, and 
due to a change in administration in Yugoslavia, in Croatia, uh, that became somewhat friendlier, well, quite a bit friendlier toward the tribunal, we were ultimately able to get a large number of transcripts, which we call the presidential transcripts, which really opened up, I mean, put us right into the conference rooms when these meetings and conversations were taking place. One of those is this one in June of eight, June 8th, 1991. And this gives you the flavor along with a few others as to Tujman's and the Croats' attitude toward Bosnia. He said, if we opt for Croatia's independence, either within an alliance or total independence, Croatia's borders, such as they are today, are absurd. They are impossible in the sense of administration and trade, let alone as regards any kind of protection of these borders of Croatia. From our point of view, no less than from the Serbian, there is the problem of, there is the need to find an essential solution to the problem, isn't that so? Because the establishment of Bosnia, the borders of Bosnia and Herzegovina after World War II are historically absurd. He said in another meeting, a very important meeting, it probably, if, there, if I had to say that, if I had to pick one single meeting, there was a very important meeting in Zagreb, the capital of Croatia, at the end of December, 1991, where Tuzman met with the, the Croat leadership and most, much of the Bosnian Croat leadership, the, the Croats from Bosnia came to travel to Zagreb. And there was a very important, obviously a planning session. And at that time, Tuzman says, uh, the survival of Bosnia and Herzegovina as an independent and sovereign state, even if possible, is in any case against the interest of the Croatian state and makes impossible the normal territorial establishment of the Croatian state and creates conditions for the disappearance of what remains of the Croatian people in Bosnia and Herzegovina today. All of history has shown that Bosnia and Herzegovina is no solution for the Croatian people. Bosnia and Herzegovina should not be taken as something God-given which must be preserved and we must especially not forget how harmful it is because of the creation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia has been put in an impossible situation regarding its territory. So you can see that uh, you can see what Tuzman and the Croats, some of the Croats, the nationalist Croats had in mind. I'm gonna skip over the next, well, I won't skip over it because this, the concept of the Banovina, which you see there at the top of the page is really essential. What the Banovina was in 1939, right at the beginning of World War II, um, partly through the interaction with the Germans, um, Croatia for a time did include, the territory of Croatia did include this area called the Banovina, which covered much of what then subsequently became Bosnia. And that they never really quite got over that, I guess one might say. And they always felt that that was rightfully their territory, that they should have, they should still have the Banovina. And I'll show you on a map in a moment what that looked like. So Tuzman says at the same December 1991 meeting, the state of Croatia cannot survive such as it is, but a Croatian state, even with the borders of the Banovina, Banovina could, not to mention if these borders were improved on, Therefore, we finally wanted, and it was no accident, that in the preamble to the Croatian constitution, we also mentioned the Banovina of Croatia. It seems to me, therefore, that just as we have taken advantage of this historic moment to establish an independent, internationally recognized Croatia, I believe that, the time, that it is time that we take the opportunity to gather the Croatian people inside the widest possible borders. Now, I, should, I probably should have said this before, but I'll pause and say it now. Many people, probably if anyone knows one person, one personality about going back to the Yugoslavia conflict, it's Slobodan Milosevic and his desire and the, and the Serbian desire for a greater Serbia, to carve large parts of Bosnia out, join it with Serbia, increase the Serbian territory, exclude non-Serbs, et cetera, et cetera. That's what Milosevic was all about. Well, people don't realize, for the most part, uh, very few people realize that really Tuzman, President Tuzman of Croatia, was just like Milosevic, and the Croats had exactly the same designs on Bosnia, different territory. I mean, the Serbs mostly wanted the eastern half of the country, and the Croats mostly wanted the western half of the country, and that's what it came down to. 
And that's why we're talking about Tujman because that sets up the entire conflict that then I became involved in prosecuting. So that was the territorial ambition of the, what we call the joint criminal enterprise. If you will think of conspiracy uh, that was charged in the indictment that the territorial ambition of the joint criminal enterprise of those participating, including Tujman, including my, the people that I prosecuted was to establish a Croatian territory with the borders of the Banovina. It was part of the joint criminal enterprise to engineer the political and ethnic map of these areas so that they would be Croat dominated both politically and demographically. So there you can see what it looked like. Uh, the areas outlined in red, um, well, number one, the yellow area is Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Croatia is in fact a strong, a, a strangely shaped country. It's almost like a V. It wraps around from the top down and then down the Dalmatian coast, which is a beautiful area if you ever have a chance to visit it. Uh, that was Croatia. And then, then we have Bosnia in the middle and then the parts within the red lines, that was the Banovina of 1939. And then, so what, that's been overlaid on the map of Bosnia. That's the territory that the Croat, that Tujman and the Croats wanted to have. In order to do that, they then carved out this Western part of the, the area that down in the Southwest or the Western part of the country, uh, the, that you see there, they carved that out and decided to call it the Croatian community of Herceg Bosna. And it was supposed to be a mini Croat state. And the idea was to take over that territory to exclude or at least subjugate the Muslims and become either part of or closely allied to uh, Croatia. So that, that it was never internationally recognized as a legitimate state but it was active during the war and set up its own government, its own armed forces, et cetera. The Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina declared, declared the entity illegal first in 1992 and then again in 1994. <clears throat> the people involved. Well, we've already talked about the Croatian president, Franjo Tuđman. Then we have the Croatian minister of defense, Goško Šušak. Then we had Janko Bobetko, who was the head of the Croatian army. We had the president of Herceg Bosna, which was a man named Mati Boban. As you'll see here, unfortunately, all four of those men died um, after, the, after the conflict um, at the times indi dates indicated. And then we have the six that six of the people prosecuted in the one case that we're talking about, that we're talking about now. Yadranko Perlic, who was the prime minister or president of the government, the minister of defense, uh, the head of the HBO armed forces, Slobodan Prajak, uh, another time, at another period of time, the head or deputy head of the HBO, the, the Croat armed forces, Milovoj Pektovic, and the head of the HBO military police, Valentin Choric, and the coordinator of Really, that's a, this, this one's a name I made up. He, he held several different positions, but ultimately he was a major official dealing with moving the Muslims out of Herceg Bosna. And there were others. And I prosecuted a number. I prosecuted the Kordic case, the Tuta case, and the Ryich case as well. Uh, but those are stories for a different day. So I'm gonna go quickly. Yadranko Perlich, he again was the head of the government, uh, the prime minister, if you will. Bruno Stojic was the defense minister. Slobodan Prajek was the head of the HBO armed forces. HBO stand, stood for the Croatian Defense Council. It was both the government, it, it existed both in terms of as a government and as the armed forces. Milivoj Petkovic, who again was head of the armed forces for, for two different periods of time. Valentin Choric was the head of the military police was extensively involved in crimes against the Muslims. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't very good police. Uh, they were some of the worst actors in the, in the conflict. And Berislav Pusic, who was this other official who uh, was quite a bit lower down the chain of command, the, the ladder, if you will, from the others that were just named, but he was just so involved in uh, ethnically cleansing the Muslims 
on behalf of the of the of Herzeg Bosnia, the HBO government, that well, we just couldn't leave him, we just couldn't leave him out. The problem was, however, that they wanted to create Herzeg Bosnia. They wanted to create this 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 Croat area, but the reality was. Uh, the Croats were only a plurality in the entire area that they claimed to be Herzeg Bosna. The Croats were only 44% of the population. And in fact, in Mostar, uh, which they claimed to be their capital, the Croats were only 33.8% of the population. So what do you do? You want to have a Croat territory. You don't want, you don't want the Muslims or Serbs around. Uh, so what are you going to do? This is another map of Bosnia that shows the various ethnic composition of the different municipalities. In Bosnia, a municipality is like a state. Um, so if you think of the states, if you think of Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, um, you're seeing the states of Bosnia there in front of you on this map. And if you took the time, if we had the time and you went through, you can you see some very interesting uh, ethnic and demographic information as to the population. Uh, again, the problem for the Herzog Bosnians was that um, much of their territory included a lot of actually predominant Muslim, Muslim majority areas. So again, what do you do? Mati Boban says at the same December 1991 meeting, he, he says, well, okay, we have this problem demographically. We have this problems with ethnicity. By cleansing the border areas, practically border areas of Herzog Bosna, this creates approximately 65% of the Croatian population in Herzog Bosna. So if we cleanse the border areas, we can increase the percentage of the Croat population. Um, so that's what, that's what we're gonna have to do. <clears throat> and then the last thing I'll read again, and it's a long, rather a long quote by Tujman, but again, it's rather important and gives you a complete feel for the situation. Um, and this, this even ties in directly with Milosevic. So Tujman says at the same meeting, why not accept an offer of demarcation from Milosevic when it is in the interest of the Croatian people? Because I do not see a single reason, a serious reason against it. One of our people in Bosnia drafted a proposal for demarcation whereby the Croatian areas and those that you have included in this community of Herzeg Bosna and in the community of Croatian Posavina, another area that we won't get to today. In the event of demarcation, Croatia would get those two communities, which would satisfy almost ideally the Croatian national interest, not only present, but also for the future. And then to create a statelet, therefore, out of the remaining part around Sarajevo, where mostly Muslims and some Catholic Croats would stay, which would resemble the small historical land of Bosnia. Well, th there was no such small historical land of Bosnia, but that's what Tujman says. It would therefore be this, this small remaining Muslim area would be a buffer zone in the demarcation between Serbia and Croatia. So he's saying, why not? Why not agree with Milosevic to carve up Bosnia? And why not do it this way? And it's completely in our interest to do so. <clears throat> Janko Wobetko, who, as I said earlier, was the head of the Republic of Croatian Army, uh, was, was actually told, was sent down to, was sent down to Bosnia to meet with the Bosnian Croat leadership, Perlic, Prajak, and Petkovic to see how the Croats, the Croat government could help out and the Croat military could help out in accomplishing these, these territorial goals. And of course, Tujman says to Shushak and Bobetko, Shushak was the Minister of Defense and says, well, don't do it openly. I mean, do it on the sly because we don't want the international community. We don't want the world, what the world doing that we're actually intervening down there. Um, so see, at the end he says, but then it could, but then again, of course, do not give it, do not give the help openly. And there was this really interesting, really interesting uh, document and another transcript that we obtained where what had happened was that Shushak and Bobetko had prepared a written order on a written order, putting in writing that Tudun was appointing the head of the Bosnian Croat military in Bosnia. And Tujman has a fit. And Tujman says, 
are you guys effectively says, are you guys crazy? This is providing proof that we're the giving the orders down there. Um, so he, he scolds, he scolds uh, and Bobet, uh, sorry, Shushak and Bobetko and basically says, don't ever put anything like that in writing. Um, and then he says, so draft a different document not, that, that it's actually Boban, not me, but Boban, who's appointing the head of the Bosnian Croat military. And so they said, yes. And Tuchman says he has instructed Boban to work up an order appointing Rosso uh, as HBO commander. And Shushak responds, again, showing you that they did whatever Zagreb told them to do. Shushak responds, Boban did it at once. As soon as we sent it, he said so. Total control of what, total Croat control of what was happening in Bosnia on the Croat side. Well, another map, and this one again shows you the boundaries and um, the, the red stars are what we call our crime base. These are the crime scenes, the large crime scenes. When we're talking about crime scenes, sometimes it was the municipality or the state. These were the crime base areas that were prosecuted in, in the case at trial. Um, you can see within what was Hersig Bosnia, within those blue lines down there, there were only those light blue areas that had at least a Croat plurality, sometimes a majority or at least a plurality. And then you can see how much of it was not Croat, in fact, but that's, they still wanted that territory because again, that had been the Banovina. When we think about when we think about the if we get to the questions about how expensive and how long these trials are, think about proving those crimes. Think about proving that crime base over half of the over roughly a third to half of the country of different crimes at different times, different scenes, sometimes going on for weeks or months or longer. Uh, the Mostar siege, Mostar is the down in the, one of the red stars down there in the Southwest, uh, the capital of Hersu Bosna. And there was a siege there against the Muslims in that town, very similar to the Sarajevo siege. And in fact, if anything, even more intense actually uh, than the Sar what happened in Sarajevo. But again, most people have heard of Sarajevo, but they've never heard of Mostar. And of course I spent a lot of time in Mostar. Uh, after the war. So just to give you a flavor for some things, maps showing crime scenes, maybe maybe atrocities, mass killings, um, things that we're, we were interested in trying to prove, uh, aerial photographs of a bunch of people gathered on a football pitch in, uh, in Bosnia, uh, being gathered together where they went, whether they were taken away in buses or trucks, whether some of them were killed, I can't tell you at this point, but they were obviously being gathered together uh, to do something with them. Amici was one of the major atrocities during the war. Uh, on a morning in April, 1993, uh, Bosnian Croats attacked the Muslims in the village and 100, about 113 civilians were massacred. Um, a terrible event. One of the, again, one of the major atrocities of the war. And uh, uh, we prosecuted, we prosecuted uh, virtually all the main per principal perpetrators and they were all convicted in one way or another uh, for that particular atrocity. A destroyed minaret of a mosque uh, that was blown up uh, with dynamite uh, by the Croat side, uh, that was Anomichi. A body, a burned body. All this, well, both the Serb side and the Croat side operated what essentially were concentration camps where other, the other people, if they were, if you were a Croat, you wanted non-Croats. You wanted the Serbs and the Muslims and you put them in these, you put the men especially in these camps. Um, so these camps were operated. They were terrible, terrible conditions. And, um, and that again was part of our case. Uh, mass graves. And many, many reclaimed, recovered uh, 
Muslim bodies out of mass graves that were then given given new burials um, after the war. I selected this one report. Again, we were very fortunate. Well, we weren't fortunate. We worked our butts off to get it, but we eventually were able to collect a large volume of documents from the Boston Croat side through one means or another. And again, we don't have time to cover everything today, but we did have a large document collection. And I always like this one because it shows the attitude of the Croats toward the Muslims and toward ethnic cleansing. So this is an actual report of a military police report on the 15th of June, 1993. No criminal acts or incidents were notified yesterday. Only the ethnic cleansing of the town from persons of Muslim nationality were noticed. The perpetrators of the ethnic cleansing are members of the HBO 4th Battalion and members of the anti-terrorist group Kraljevich. These are Croat Army, uh, Cro Boston Croat Army units. But the attitude there is no criminal acts, only a little ethnic cleansing, no big deal. And that was the attitude that we encountered. The results of ethnic cleansing, an expert demographic study of the eight municipalities that we chose at issue in the case showed that by 1998, all from 1992 and then reaching getting to 1998, by that time, 75% of the non-Croats no longer lived in their 1991 homes. So you can see the ethnic cleansing was largely quite successful. The Perlitz trial. Well, this is a this is a team. This is a picture of sort of we call this the last the last one standing. Um, the trial lasted for five years, so we actually had people that were that came and left, came after the trial started, worked on the trial for a while, then left before the trial ended. And at the end, in, at the end in 2011, uh, this was what was the prosecution team, myself there in the middle, and then surrounded by various of my colleagues. Um, actually, again, at different times, it would look different. It would look some of them were there the whole time, and uh, at other times, it would look different than that. And I guess that's what happens when you have a trial that lasts five years. So as I mentioned, uh, basically the, what the crimes covered in our indictment uh, was the time period was October 1992 to November 1993. Uh, yeah, primarily November. Some went, went, things went into 94, but primarily November 1993. We had eight, municipal, eight municipalities was our, was our focus. As I mentioned earlier, those are similar to uh, U.S. states, Prozor, Yablonitsa, Stolats, Lubushki, Gorny Vakuf, Mostar, Chaplina, and Varish. And four of the major, the four major Bosnian Croat detention camps, uh, Heliodrome, Dretel, Lubushki, and Gavala. Uh, we, what was charged in the case, uh, persecution, uh, mass expulsions, forcible transfers, and deportations and related conduct, killings, rape, sexual assault, plunder, looting, uh, unlawful imprisonment and improper conditions of confinement, inhuman treatment. Again, these were, this was hap what was happening in these large, again, essentially concentration camps where especially men, but also, also women were being held. They were also sometimes forced to engage in labor. Sometimes they were sent to the front lines uh, to do tasks that the uh, Croats themselves didn't want to do under dangerous conditions. And some of them were killed. Some prisoners were killed because they were doing forced labor on the confrontation line. Uh, wanton and massive destruction of property, including cultural and religious property. Uh, there was a famous call, a bridge called the Old Bridge that crossed the river there in Mostar uh, that was destroyed by the Bosnian Croats during the conflict and numerous mosques, of course, were targets for destruction. As to Mostar, you also had unlawful attack, infliction of terror, cruel treatment, including sniping, shelling, deprivation of humanitarian aid. Again, there was the Mostar siege that was cut off for about nine months with very little aid coming, getting into the, into the enclave. This is a similar, just another similar listing of the charges in a different way. Um, 
CAH stands for Crime Against Humanity. Uh, GB stands for Grave Breach of the Geneva Conventions. So you can see the nature that what was charged and, and the number on the right on the right column is the count of the indictment. Uh, so persecution was charged in count one. Uh, LCW stands for violation of the law and customs of war. So those were the three basic things that we were pursuing, either crimes against humanity, grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, or violations of the laws and customs of war. Um, down to 26 counts altogether. Very different than an American indictment. There would have been many, much, many more, more, many more counts in an American indictment. These these counts were huge. They covered huge times, spans of time and areas. Um, but that's the way that we had to charge it um, at, at the ICTY. Perlich case statistics. As I mentioned, um, well, the trial lasted five years. And uh, in fairness, it wasn't, we weren't in trial every day. So we, we, there would be times when someone would take an appeal, the trial would be suspended for a month or something. Or of course, then you had the summer holiday, you had August off usually for a month. You had Christmas usually off for about a month from mid-December to mid-January. So I'm not saying we were in trial every single day for a five year period, but the trial did last. <laughs> Uh, five years altogether. Um, we filed our proposed indictment in February of 2004. It was confirmed by a reviewing judge and uh, arrest warrants were issued and the various accused came into custody, uh, made their initial appearances in April of 2004. We made our pretrial prosecution, pretrial filings, our trial brief, our witness list, our exhibit list in January of 2006. So this gives you the statistics of the prosecution case. I don't know how many of you pursuing a criminal justice area of study have had the opportunity to participate in a criminal trial, maybe in Denver District Court or federal court or someplace, uh, maybe in Colorado or elsewhere. Uh, I can assure you that the statistics probably look something different than this. So our prosecuting uh, prosecution opening statement was on April 26, 2006. We actually took the judges on a six day visit to Bosnia and visited the major crime scenes. Uh, it, was a fan, it was an incredible experience. Uh, of course, the defense, were, defense was along as well. You can, security, well, you can imagine, it was, quite, it was quite, um, quite an operation, but we actually traveled around with the judges for six days in Bosnia uh, from one end to the other of Herzeg, Bosnia, uh, the Croat area. The last day of the prosecution case was January 24th, 2008. So you can see prosecution case took a little more, a little bit more than a year and a half. Total court days, 246 days in court. Prosecution witnesses, 145 presented live in the courtroom. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Another 100 were presented on paper. The, the, the rules of the tribunal allowed some type of evidence to come in on paper. Uh, the, a written statement of a witness, uh, which on, ver for, on various grounds or for various reasons could come in based on paper and the witness didn't actually have to come, it didn't actually have to come to court. Our total, so then based on that, our total prosecution witnesses were 245. We had made it a total of 5,031 exhibits and the total transcript pages just during the prosecution case was over 26,000 pages of transcript. Now I mentioned that we put on 145 uh, witnesses in court. We were given a very strict time limit on how much well, how much time we could take, uh, which again, we could talk about a lot longer. I think we were ultimately finally given about 300 hours to actually present our case, the prosecution case. And you will see that we came in just under it, prosecuting 296 hours at the actual that was the actual direct examination, the time that prosecution prosecuting attorney actually questioned the witness in court. Didn't count cross-examination, didn't count the judges asking questions, that was just the prosecution time. But when you look at that, and you look at that, that comes down to an average of about two hours per witness. And having been a federal prosecutor here in Denver for 12 years before I went to The Hague, let me tell you, that is moving at some speed. 
So again, if we have a chance to talk about, well, why, could, why are these trials so long? Well, maybe they're not so long. Uh, we were moving at breakneck speed most of the time uh, and complaining about it, frankly, that it was, we, were, we were rushed, our time was short, but that's the conditions that, we, that were imposed on us. The defense case actually took longer than the prosecution case, which is because I'm sort of unusual because even though there were six accused, but nonetheless, it's the prosecution that has the burden of proof to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, but they went on for, again, almost two, almost two years, um, almost two years, like 260 court days. They put on 63 witnesses in court, uh, some on paper for a total of 77. Again, 3,678 exhibits and another 24,000 pages in transcript. A massive undertaking. And this was one of the largest trials at the tribunal, but not the only one. There were four, uh, there were probably six or seven total. At, at the end of the day, there were maybe six or seven trials kind of like this on this scale. Um, like Milosevic, like Karadich, like some of the other major leadership cases. Okay, we are getting to the end, I assure everyone. Um, closing arguments that were then the, between February and March 2011. Overall, the trial and the hearings consumed 547 days in court. I don't think you'll find too many Denver district attorneys who spent 547 days in one trial. Uh, total witnesses on paper, 318 witnesses were called either in court or on paper, uh, nine, more, almost 10,000 exhibits and more than 52,000 pages of transcript. What was the ending of it all? Well, we were very fortunate and well, again, not so fortunate. We just we did it after a lot of, as a result of a lot of hard, hard work and dedication. All six accused were convicted, and those were the sentences that they received. Um, some may say that given the crimes that were committed, these sentences seem fairly light. Um, and I would say that by US standards, by American standards, they are pretty light. Uh, <coughs> Europeans seem to have a different, uh, different measuring stick when it comes to, to, uh, to sentencing, and this is sort of European style sentencing. Although, as I said earlier, uh, seven accused in other cases were given, not in any one case, but over various cases, seven accused were given life. Uh, none of our people were given life. And as you can see here, what the numbers were. Um, but we were very, very happy that we convicted all six of multiple serious crimes. Um, so actually we were quite happy with that. And I think that brings us to the end. I know I've moved very quickly, but I wanted to also provide plenty of time um, for questioning at the end. And I think we're coming in just at about at the right time because we have about a half hour, I think, for questions. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Perfect timing, by the way. <laughs> okay, so we have three questions in here at the moment. Um, I did send a message, anybody who didn't see it, Feel free to start sending questions through the Q&A portion of this video, and then we'll try to get some of these answered for you guys. So, Ken, the first one that came in says, how does restorative justice like they used in South Africa post-apartheid work? Uh, well, I guess the, the, to be the, the fully truthful answer is I, I'm not a particular expert on restorative justice. Um, I have always been, I guess, on the non-restorative justice side of things, if people want to put it that way, in terms of uh, primarily being prosecuting people for the end of, uh, of, of hopefully conviction and sentencing. Um, I can't, I'm not an expert, nor am I an expert on what happened in, in apartheid. Uh, what I will say about what happened in, in South Africa, because it's often held up as sort of a model of, um, they had a truth commission, and it's often held up as sort of a, a, a competing model of a post-conflict situation, uh, a different form of justice. Um, the Truth Commission was certainly a helpful thing. However, what most people don't realize is that the Truth Commission was only supposed to be part of what happened. They were actually, the Truth Commission was actually supposed to be followed by prosecutions 
And because of the fatigue that set in after the long uh, truth commission went on, most of those prosecutions never happened. And if you talk to South Africans today, and in fact, I was just talking to one two weeks ago, uh, their view is that their system failed because um, they never got around to actually prosecuting the main perpetrators of the case. Um, other than that, I'll have to let you talk to people, someone who knows more about restorative justice than I do. And I'm sorry that I can't tell you more. Still a very interesting answer. Thank you. Um, next one. Do you need a separate certification to work in international courts? Are you allowed to work on cases that involve your own country or is that a conflict of interest? Um, no, you don't have to have a separate certification. You just really, you have to be a member in good standing of your whatever state bar, depending on, uh, you know, in the United States, it would be your state bar. If, it, if you were coming from another country, of course, it would be maybe a different organization or entity that does that. But as long as you were a member, in, a member of your, your bar uh, in good standing, uh, anyone could potentially uh, work on both the, either the prosecution side or on the defense side. Uh, no, there was no um, problem with someone prosecuting if they were from that country. Although, well, mostly for security reasons, we didn't have Croat, for example, we didn't have Croat prosecutors in our office. Uh, and I, again, there was actually espionage conducted against the tribunal. Things were being carried out of the tribunal at one point. So there were security concerns. So we didn't have we didn't have Croat or Serb prosecutors, for example, but we had American attorneys, Serb attorneys, Croat attorneys who were on the defense side, uh, of course, and uh, there was nothing that prevented them from uh, doing that work. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, let me do a few of these. I have a few votes on here. Um, where are those who were convicted by ICTY being held in prison? Very good question. Uh, the UN itself has no prison system. Um, when they were being, when they were on trial, they were there was a detention unit created as part in as part of a a Dutch prison in the Hague, and part of it was carved off uh, and set up as a separate unit, and that's where people would be held during trial. Once their conviction is final on appeal. Uh, and they're then sent out to serve their sentence. What would happen is various national systems would vol essentially volunteer to take so many, a prisoner or so many prisoners uh, convicted, convicted accused and put them into their national prison systems for the purposes of serving their system, uh, excuse me, serving their sentence. So you might wind up in the UK, you might wind up in Italy, you might wind up in one of the Scandinavian countries uh, you would literally just get farmed, well, I hate to say the word, but literally farmed out to a, a national prison system somewhere that was a UN member state. Interesting. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next one is, so it says, my question is regarding the children and families that are currently held in cages at the border. Um, is that considered a crime against a race? And if so, who will be prosecuted if that issue is taken to court? Wow. Um, well, my, pers my personal view is that, you know, there are human rights violations going have, have happened that are going on. Uh, I don't think anyone's talked about it being a, those are being criminal violations at this point. Um, if there were going to be prosecutions or civil rights or well, civil rights cases in the United States, they would be brought in, of course, in civil courts, probably by you know, some public interest organization like the, um, like the ACLU or somebody like that. Um, now, conceivably, if there's a change of administrations, the, the uh, Civil Rights Division of the US Justice Department could get involved. But again, uh, since they would basically be largely prosecuting uh, members of the federal government, that would definitely be a complication. Not impossible by any means, but certainly a complication. But uh, I think probably the most of what we'll see at some point are will be civil cases brought by NGOs. Thank you. Um, a more of a personal question for you. Did you, um, or do you have to speak a different language or did you learn one while you were over there? Good question. Um, 
No, unfortunately, I'm, well, unfortunately or otherwise, uh, I worked in English. The tribunal had really two official languages, uh, English and French. And then again, because we were dealing with the Yugoslavia conflict where people spoke uh, Serbo-Croatian, um, that was an, that was the other, it wasn't an official language of the tribunal, but that was another the language that all of us had to deal with. Um, no, you had, we had to have extensive, a few people, you know, a few people learned a little bit of Serbo-Croatian in my experience. Some of my colleagues, you know, you could have a, a limited conversation, but for the most part, uh, everything was done through interpreters. If you went into the field, if you went to Bosnia to, to, to interview witnesses, you always had interpreters with you. If you were in the courtroom, everything was translated in the courtroom. Yeah, you wore a headset. So you had a headset in court and you had simultaneous translation in English, French, and serbo croatian depending on what channel you were on. Um, that in itself, um, you know, complicates these proceedings substantially. When you have to, you know, the very good, the translate, the interpreters in the courtroom were very good, but it still takes time and you're still waiting. The question has to be interpreted. The answer has to be interpreted. So you can again imagine operating in a, in a, in a tr criminal trial with that situation. Um, again, quite different than most what you would experience in most domestic trials. Not to say that there isn't translation, of, especially obviously in Spanish in this part of the country. But um, no, you did, not have to, you did not have to know or learn another language if you, as long as you could operate in either, you had to either operate in English or French. But other than that, you didn't have to learn another language. Good question. Um, what was the average age of the people convicted, would you say? Oh, boy. Hmm. Well, I would say the average, I'm just, I've never really, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I've never really thought about that, to be honest, but I would say generally, probably the average age, probably somewhere between 45 to 60 somewhere in that range. Uh, a few, there would be a few younger and a few older. Uh, but these were, because again, we were not focusing on the foot soldiers. We weren't talking about the privates or the, the, even the sergeants. We were trying to get to senior military commanders, senior political figures like Milosevic, like Tujman. And of course, those people were older. Um, these were more senior people, actors higher up in the military, higher up in the political or government arena. So they tended to be older. Thank you. Um, for someone interested in international criminal justice, how do you get your foot in the door for physicians abroad? <clears throat> very good question, a very tough question. Um, and the reason I say it's tough is because um, I won't say for obvious reasons, but um, this, this kind of work attracts a, a large number of people. Um, certainly not everyone, but a large number of people. And there are really just so many, so few positions to go around. Um, I would say, uh, to answer the question directly, I would say, first of all, <laughs> do the best you can in school, uh, get the best academic record you can possibly, you can possibly manage. Uh, I would say that after that, uh, get involved in national or in, uh, in domestic um, criminal justice work, whether it's as a prosecutor or a defense lawyer or public defender. Get some real trial experience under your belts. You don't get hired. You don't get hired at these tribunals if you've never just unless you're at a very very junior level because you've never tried a case. You're getting hired. You're, you have to come there and bring your experience and skills with you. Um, so um, do the best academically you can. Go out and spend five or six or seven years doing domestic criminal justice work. Um, and then start applying, follow, follow the, whatever tribunals exist at the time. The International Criminal Court is, again, the permanent court. There are other mechanisms, other tribunals being set up from time to time and just watch it and apply. And, you know, if you have the opportunity to, to network with anyone, if you know someone that happens to be at a tribunal, then obviously do the networking thing. Um, but I, it's, it's not easy. Um, I mean, I was very fortunate and because of what I had done and my work as a federal prosecutor, et cetera, uh, 
I was very fortunate to get hired into a senior position, but it's it's not easy. But keep okay. going. Don't give up. Great advice. Um, I was going to say, it sounds like you definitely have to have a lot in terms of experience. So it seems that way. Well, there are junior positions, uh, but again, the competition is, is, again, still very keen. Right. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think we're down to our last two questions. So first one, did the ethnic cleansing go beyond just Muslims? For example, did it extend into the Jewish population? At various times, it extended to anyone who was not a member of the cleansing group, so to speak, the group doing the cleansing. So if you're talking about the Croats, they could potentially be cleansing, well, especially Muslims, uh, but also Serbs. They didn't like the Serbs either. Or other, uh, or other, you know, minority groups. Um, I'm blanking on the, um, I'm blanking on the name. Gypsies. I mean, gypsies. Uh, certainly, Jewish people as well. I mean, it wasn't on a large scale, but again, in general, if you were on the Croat side, it was anyone who wasn't a Croat. If you were on the Serb side, it was anyone not a Serb. Um, now the Muslims committed some crimes as well, but not on the same not on the same scale as the Serbs and the against non-Muslims, but against uh, I mean against non-Muslims, but certainly not on the same scale as the Croats and the Serbs did. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then last question: How are the judges appointed to these types of trials? Very good question. Um, they are appointed through a process in the United Nations, uh, at least as to, well, at least as to the ICTY uh, and the uh, Rwanda uh, tribunals, because these were UN bodies. The International Criminal Court is a bit different, um, but in, at the end of the day, essentially the same. Countries put forth, put their nominations, they go, they go through a process of being selected, just like suppose a little bit like selecting an international uh, national judge although it's certainly more political. Um, there may be trading votes in the UN. You know, if you vote, if you vote for my guy, I'll vote for your guy. Um, it is a political process. Uh, frankly, uh, and this would have to be part of a much longer conversation, but the international community, the UN didn't always do us many favors in the judges that it sent. Some of the, you would like to think that the, we had the best judges and we'd get the cream of the crop from every judicial system in the world, the best judges. Uh, unfortunately, that very often didn't happen. And a lot of the judges we had were frankly not very good. Um, and I've said that publicly a number of times and we'll keep doing so. Uh, but um, they would come out of the national systems. And so, you know, they'd be, but they came from all over the world. You know, we had German judges, English judges, French judges. And in, in this trial we've been talking about today, the Perlitz trial, uh, the presiding judge was French. Then I had a Swiss judge, and a Hungarian judge, and an African uh, a Ga a judge from Ghana as the alternate judge. Uh, so the judges came from all over the world. Um, some, I, I should say, some were very good, but many were not, unfortunately. And then I apologize, there's actually a follow-up question to that one as well. You kind of touched no on it, um, but I heard, um, they said, I heard you mention multiple judges was it a panel of judges? And since the case was so long, was there any judge turnover during those five years? <laughs> yes, um, you're absolutely right. Because of the judges, were, because these trials were so big, um, uh, not as always as big as this one. But uh, as I said, we actually had an alternate judge. Uh, there was no jury. Uh, there's no way, of course, among other things, that you could impanel, impanel a jury for five years. But in any event, there's no jury. Uh, trials were to a panel of three judges um, in every, there'd be a presiding judge and two other judges. And then in most cases, um, if there were courts, were, if the trial was going to be long at all, there was at least one alternate judge. Um, I'm trying to remember if any of the alternate judges, if any of the regular, quote, regular judges didn't survive the trial and <laughs> one of the alternate judge had to step in. I can't think of a situation off the top of my head. Um, where that happened. It's mm, at least not in Yugoslavia. Now, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, somewhere else, it could have, hap it could have happened. I can't remember it happening at the Yugoslavia Tribunal. Um, that, yeah. 
I mean, it was a crazy thing because you had this alternate judge sitting there for five years, uh, listening to the evidence and being there, but then at the end of the day, uh, not being involved in deliberations. So quite a difficult or challenging situation. Yeah, that's definitely very interesting. Um, so that looks like it wraps it up for questions. On behalf of the school and everybody here, I just wanted to say thank you again for being here. This was very, very eye-opening, definitely a subject that I'm sure a lot of people don't get to hear about. So having somebody firsthand tell us about it is super cool. Um, so thank you again for taking time out to be here with us. Is there anything else that you wanted to throw out before we wrap it up? Well, I, I, I'll go back to the question about the people some, from someone who was interested, presumably interested in doing this kind of work. and. Despite my perhaps a little bit discouraging answer, if anyone, if any of you are inclined to get involved in international criminal justice, international human rights work, please do pursue it. Uh, it may be challenging, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. And uh, I, I, it's a great thing to do. It's an important thing to do. It's a rewarding thing to do. Sometimes, often challenging, uh, often uh, annoying, often you pull your hair out. But uh, it's an important and good thing to do. So those of you who might be interested in pursuing it, please don't be discouraged nonetheless by anything I said. Uh, go for it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken. Well, again, thank you for being here. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up. If anybody else has any questions, feel free to email me or Sheila Huss with anything follow-up. But again, thank you for being here, taking time out of your day. And I hope you have a fantastic night. Thank you.